Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 6.1, what is um, the understanding of OpenMP parallel programming. And it builds on top of our lecture six that we had the last time. And we introduce it as a new programming standard more for shared memory systems. Before we had always MPI, the message passing interface, which was more for distributed systems. And in subsequent lectures, you will actually also learn that you can combine both, so MPI and of course OpenMP, meaning you combine distributed memory programming with shared memory programming in order to catch the best performance of an application. But before we go into the material of the lecture today on practical lecture 6.1, let us review what we had the last time in lecture six, what is basically um, the basics of OpenMP. And before we did anything with OpenMP, we were reviewing a little bit what shared memory programming entails. And this is what you see here on the top. Basically, you can see that we have um, a shared address space, which is important because we have learned in the last lecture, the way how we interact with different, let's say, parallel threads here in the CPUs is in this memory space. So we don't have really send and receive messages as we had with the message passing interface. Here, every thread will actually have access to the same memory, so the shared memory address space. And we also learned that in terms of basically looking at it um, from the access, we don't have any more, let's say, many processes really. Instead, we talk about many threads basically doing this. And from this, we have this two ways how you can architecturally implement this on the system. So basically you see here a uniform memory access, so-called UMA, where every basically CPU has, of course, the same memory access or kind of uniform memory access to read and write uh, variables and so forth. But you can have also a CC NUMA and non-uniform memory access, for instance, where you have here this bus interconnect that ensures that you know everyone has here still, still to the shared address space and does some cache currency and so on. So, but this is more the way basically how it is architecturally implemented. You as a programmer, you don't see any of that. You still assume that the threads will have full access to the memory in order to solve a problem. And again, think about what we did in MPI and basically in distributed memory programming. This was all very different. We didn't have this you know, shared address space that we can use. Instead, we had all these different processors that sent and received messages, did broadcast, MPI barriers, whatever you program. Here, the interaction is not directly between the different threads. So again, important for MPI, we had the processors here in OpenMP. They talk about lightweight threads, which of course are also simpler to manage by the system. Um, especially also because they have access to the shared memory. So this is a very important distinguish mechanism between the distributed memory that we have seen before. Still as a standard, <coughs> one of the goals of this OpenMP standard is then of course to enable porting of this particular you know, application that implement the OpenMP standard. So in other words, you can imagine that when you have a certain HPC machine A in some country, and it has the OpenMP library, you can almost certain say that another HPC machine um, be somewhere in another country um, will have also an OpenMP, which in one way or another will enable you to port this application relatively straightforward. So um, this is basically the idea of the standard. And in order to make the shared memory approach, of course, feasible, um, you have to basically use different, um, you know, HPC machines and don't want to program it necessarily just for one specific system. Then we continued a little bit with the insights of OpenMP, um, starting slowly to understand that we basically actually have a different way how we really program this. Um, because as we did in the basically the idea of MPI, we always had basically different processes talking to each other. And with this, we enabled parallel computing. And we learned with MPI init and finalized, we had a parallel region of sort, which enables us with MPI. Here, it's all different. You would say you have a lifeline of a application, what we call here the master thread. So the master thread will always survive, as you see here, basically number one, 
in this example. But the idea was to fork different threads at different regions in the program, right? So where then the different threads can actually play a role and engage in a parallel problem. While the master thread is then kind of basically um, surviving this parallel region in, in strong words to get your understanding right, because then you have in this join again, basically just a serial part or a serial program. So, and by doing so, we found that the way how you program this in shared memory is always different. So you would have uh, different work sharing constructs and so-called sentinels um, and the pragma statement that you see a little bit here in this particular hello world source code that we then started with. And you learned that this, of course, is a very important part of it in MP, but it also shows you that we here have compiler directives. In other words, we, we have a program, which is a, let's say, typical C program. And in some of those, we kind of, un, we, we really annotate with this compiler directives, hey, this should be done in parallel. So that was a takeaway message, which is a, no, a little bit different than what we learned already with MPI, where explicit send and receives were done for parallelization, where we had MPI ENET, MPI finalized for all, let's say, processes usually. So this is all different. And another difference in a way here is um, basically thinking about, um, again, the number of threads that we want to involve. So here we talk about lightweight threads. And the idea of how you basically integrate this, um, what we have shown in the conceptual lecture six was, you basically program, again, the, the kind of main or the basically the, the application that you have without taking into account the real number of threads that would be at your disposal. That is something where you basically abstract from, and this is something what you will put into the job script. And by doing this in the job script, essentially, you decouple the application from the real amount of workers or worker threads, really, that can be engaging in a parallel region, like here, four threads, including, of course, always a master thread himself as also being a worker at that particular time in this particular region. So the Pragma statement starts a parallel region, and we will have many examples, of course, today demonstrating this um, in, in different ways and different you know, work sharing constructs. But when we then compile this, and of course here the compilation is a very important part of it because we have compiler directives. So here we inform the compiler um, that some elements of this program should be actually executed in parallel, which is here in the simple example, then the printf statement of hello world. And basically the rest of this main application would be done in serial. And the outcome of this is basically that the team of threads dependent now on the number of job script threads you wanted will execute this part in parallel. So because we basically here as an example say, the, the OMP num threads is four, means it will be executed four times as a team of threads. And of course, the result then will be that we have four times hello world. Now, of course, this is something where um, basically this is a very simple example, but the key message to take away is firstly that always the, the kind of master thread becomes the thread zero, which is very important for us to understand that the master is not just, let's say, a manager controlling all the different tasks and doesn't do anything and waits until everybody's completed. It will become a task basically zero, which is done, of course, helping on the parallel region all the other threads. So with this, we have an interesting way of programming again, which is different from MPI. And perhaps here and there, you would say it's maybe an easier approach, right? You just go as we learned in the work sharing construct and say, hey, this particular part, let's say a very famous one for OpenMP is usually the for loop. I just want to basically have a pragma statement in, in order to parallelize the for loop. And then I say it should be executed by so and so many number of threads. And then I'm done. Or I had this different sections, you know, if you remember um, data parallel and functional parallelism, when you wouldn't have the sections doing different things, for instance, or if you would really have just one single was also possible, um, which of course should be handled uh, in a way with care because in the end, then you don't need parallel computing. But of course here and there it can make sense that in one part also uh, there's just a, a need for doing single. 
And we had some other elements like the critical regions I will also review today. But it shows you also that essentially here, um, you have again the concept of this master thread and then the idea of entering a parallel region that you have programmed with pragma and then continue after the join. And this is completed with a more serial line in the master thread. So similar like here, conceptually, you see here the idea when you talk about the work sharing constructs. And although it seems to be simple to always do this in front, also think about that this approach is in a way is limited. Think about that we are basically only um, able to, you know, work in a node where you have shared access to memory. So in other words, if you increase more and more threats, it doesn't help you to scale up. It will help you in the beginning to scale up, obviously, because you have more threats and more parallelization. But of course, the memory is limit and the amount of CPUs is limit that actually can trigger all these threats. In other words, at some point in time, you will see that, you know, I have large um, programs and I will show you at the end here today also an example of this clustering algorithm. If you remember HPDB scan, which is an open MP and MPI implementation. So it's basically a hybrid application we will learn later. But um, if you just do it with open MP and with large data sets, you will have problems because of course the large data set will not really fit into the memory of let's say one little node. And then with this, you already experience the limits of shared memory programming. Of course, if it would be scalable, then it would, would be the best approach because the access to shared memory is fast. It, before I start potter off and copying buffers and you know, then also preparing receiving buffers with MPI, what, that's what we did. Lots of overhead to really send you know, data from one node to the other because you don't have the shared memory access. If you have the shared memory access, it's incredible fast. But of course, um, it, of course, we know of directly limited because we had to stay within a node. And I show you this a little bit more in practical examples later. And I think this was more or less the, the main aspects of it, um, what we have introduced in lecture six, obviously more in a conceptual way. And here today is now the practical um, basically associated lecture to it. So we have another one, which is basically now um, related to one of your assignments. This time we're talking about assignment three already, because we're also almost in the middle of the course now. And then we also start with the last assignment very soon. And the outline of today is really that we review again the basics of shared memory a little bit and parallel programming with these parallel regions in basically shared memory programming. And then we basically have again this kind of stepwise walkthrough I promised you that we had an MPI that we will adapt a little bit to OpenMP programs. So we still start with valid C programs and then add OpenMP directives through the Sentinel and so on. Of course, we have to review a little bit the parallel environment setup. So we don't, let's say on the job script level, want to have more and more processes and then here we talk more that maybe one process should be created that then has, let's say, four, eight, 12, 16, whatever number of threads for shared memory applications. This is an important part. And of course, it's just half of the story because when we have the hybrid lecture coming up in lecture seven, you will understand this a bit more when we compile these things that you want to be, of course, also not limited to one process. But when you want to basically combine it then you can imagine that the processes might be something that alludes then to the different worlds of MPI ranks that you then use in combination with shared memory threads on these different processes. But today we start a little bit simpler. We will just understand how we basically can use these parallel regions, how we can use this in shared memory and how the job script will look in this. Um, of course, here and there, the allocation of these compute resources, as I mentioned, will play a bigger role um, also in subsequent lectures. And here we keep it to a relatively easy degree in the beginning. Of course, the second part then of the lecture will go away from this hello threats and the, let's say, simple um, yeah, OpenMP demonstrations really to a bit more, um, let's say, elaborate examples of work sharing constructs. Um, we will go through all of them again, but here, of course, I put this time and emphasize to really give you demos of a, let's say, parallel loop example, or also, of course, the need for um, synchronization that we discussed the last time. What is a critical region? What happens if we, you know, don't use a critical region where we should have one? 
and so on. We talked a little bit also in the last lecture about this so-called persistence between parallel regions, which was a very specific features here and they're useful um, for not again, let's say recompute certain variables or so. And I will give you an example on this. And then we end a little bit with our, let's say, HBDB scan clustering algorithm that you already know now through different lectures and become more closer and closer and in really understanding it fully. Um, we basically see then, of course, their limits, um, thinking about that we have a shared memory, of course, have not really scalability enough in order to, to really for, tackle larger problems in clustering as we have here with a real life application. So after this lecture, you have really um, an idea how to use high performance clusters because you combine now your knowledge with MPI more and more with OpenMP. And both of them are the de facto standard in HPC. So when you are having a HPC job, you work in some data center, chances are that basically the, the people want you to know MPI and OpenMP. And you, with this, also understand more and more the complex aspects of parallel programming with respect to scheduling, especially because here we now have a certain granularity. We don't anymore take, talk about you know, uh, CPUs. We talk about different processes on CPUs and they spawn different threads, which are lightweight entities of doing a process. So, in, or more task really. And you see that the scheduling script like Slurma, we will review a little bit today, will give you lots of opportunities to fine tune how you actually want to have the job executed. And as I said also earlier, it connects nicely also to our hybrid lecture next time. So basically we will review this only basically in parts today to complement this then with the use of MPI later. And OpenMP is really an HPC environment tool, which is almost on all HPC centers worldwide deployed. And with there, you can really start with cutting edge applications. So learning to know um, basically this HPC programming paradigms in shared memory and distributed memory programming is really important. So let's see how we program and compile a C-based OpenMP program. Again, a short review, but I had this already in our review from the last lecture, so I keep it relatively brief. We had this different, um, basically, ideas how such a shared memory system could really look like. Although it's UMA or CC NUMA, the point is it has this cache currency. That means um, usually there's this bus and the cache currency protocol that ensures then this consistent view, because in the CC NUMA, you would have basically a distributed memory, more or less. But the protocols inside will basically then uh, give you a same view on the system, which means you essentially can program like this independent if it is a uniform memory access or non-uniform memory access. Here, the bus will help you basically to really work on this as a shared, moment, uh, shared memory program. And um, interestingly enough, of course, we discussed for programming. That means for us, we have really access to all the data from all the different, let's say, threads here, which basically here, of course, could be also a process behind it. Um, and with this have you now basically shared to data here without any communication needs. And you see, they don't really communicate with each other. They rather communicate with the memory in order to you know, write or read from the shared memory. And this will be the idea of basically OpenMP and the idea how we basically do this that we also discussed already is here and there mark so-called parallel regions in the applications. And in a way, this looks then like this, and just reviewing a little bit again, the important terminology that we had the last time, when we say it starts usually with a sequential part here in the master thread, and then you have a certain parallel region that will be parallel executed, depending on the number of threads you put in the job script. And then after that, basically is forked and all these different process, uh, the other different threads are working in this parallel region. We see then once it's finished a join back to the master uh, thread. And here, um, this is still a complete OpenMP program, right? Although we have a serial program here, because there could be another fork here at some point in time with a different number of threads if needed, for instance, in order to fix another problem. And then you go back to the serial way of working. And no matter how you do it in C or basically here in, in Fortran or so, it doesn't matter. Always these parallel regions are important. And you see usually um, here we have this pragma statement that you put in front of a loop or that you put a front of so-called regions or areas. 
that are noted now with these brackets, which is an important part of it. We learned in the Hello World example, there's basically in lecture six, the idea of maybe just putting it to one statement, but then careful, it is just executed for this particular one statement. So usually you would see OpenMP program using brackets. Also, of course, um, what we cover here in these lectures, um, for those that you know join us on YouTube and others, is of course just a, a very tiny fraction of the OpenMP API specification. So there's lots of different materials which we can dive in and basically could you know basically look at. One good example is here the UK Archer OpenMP um, you know tutorial and training which really focuses on it. And also the Uli Supercomputing Center uh, we actually collaborate has also a longer OpenMP um, trainings and tutorial, which usually takes then several days and not just two hours that I have at my disposal here. So take away the message I pick here, the selected bits and pieces to show you what an OpenMP thread can do. And of course, then, um, you know, the standard has also much more features. So reviewing this now on a, on a more idea towards getting to the practicals, we would have this thread here one and we have thread two. And basically each of those can have private data, but of course the key is then to use this kind of um, way of communication through the shared data space that you would available. And you see how that would work with this particular way where you have basically A is then here 23 in this sense. And it would maybe just write this here to some certain memory space. And because basically thread two has also access to this variable A, it can just basically read it and you know add here by one so that's why so basically you could see it as a so-called threat communication really although the threats never really communicate with each other it is going through memory and this is the same if you have here the cache current lint with cc numa right where basically the one would write to memory and then read from memory the same here with you know more uma architectures where anyway you have on the chipset the access through the memory so in a sense um, here, as a programmer, luckily, you don't have to care about any of this. Um, that helps us a little bit, of course, in the programming. And now let's go and look a little bit on the Hello Threads example. And with this, it's also important to, to really think about when you do this, not only about these constructs, um, also that the master thread itself is basically having this lifeline, right? So basically this, as we discussed, so when I come now, um, to the practicals, take into account that basically the master thread is always involved and also involved in the parallel execution of the different threads. It will be a good way of understanding. So <clears throat> let's do a little bit um, some practicals here, as I promised. I'm already on your tune here. And let's go to this um, taken HPC course here. There are some OpenMP examples now that we have here and we can just go into hello threads. This is the first one I would like to show you. So what is hello threads about? Um, you can imagine we have this hello threads C program, which is a valid C program. And what we have now is that we basically include here the header file for OpenMP on the top. And then I will make it a bit bigger here. Um, and then basically have here interesting you know, the enough similar ideas like we had in the rank environment, if you remember. So in the MPIs and ranks, and if you remember, we had the number of processes too, we had very similar things. We firstly wanted to know how many ranks we have, and then each rank was basically unique for all the different, let's say, processes we had involved. Now here, Pragma gives us very similar aspects, but of course, here we're talking about a threat ID and not a full-blown process rank of MPI. And here the number of threads is also, of course, different. This means the number of threads that we also get here in one particular parallel environment. And you see here the Pragma OMP statement to execute something in parallel denoted by these brackets. So we would assume that these parts would be here in parallel executed, which means, in other words, every thread now would have a private variable TID, the thread ID, because the private variable here is necessary so that we have assigned different values, right? We want to understand, can I have unique thread IDs for each of the different ones? And if I store it in the normal variable TID, which is obviously then shared with all others, 
we would overwrite this again. Here is a private TID. I ensure that, of course, when we get the thread number, this particular one of this particular thread executing it, then because we know with this now, and I ask for four threads, for instance, it would be four times executed, right? So hence, we would overwrite again the thread ID number. I need this private thread ID number here to ensure that each of the thread has a private instance of this TID number. And with this, we get nicely from the environment here really the number that I have, which makes us unique again. And this uniqueness in the thread ID is, of course, something which, similar like the ranks you had in MPI, enables us to influence the application logic of your program, right? You can see this is pretty simple to do. Everybody or basically every thread here has now to say hello world. Okay, thank you very much. We know that already. But of course, here you can see the construct almost similar that we had it in the rank equals zero environment in MPI, also in shared and, you know, memory, you can use a thread ID of sorts to really understand what's happening. And here you see that we basically say with the thread ID zero, we have here the master thread that we basically want to uh, do something here. And only the master thread here would now execute the number of threads and get basically the number of threads overall, right, that are basically happening to be in this pragma parallel region and assigns it to the number of threads, as it is just anyhow the um, master thread having this information, you can imagine um, basically here we don't need the private n threads because here it's okay that we basically do this, let's say in a normal variable space because everybody would then have also access to it later. And you see here, of course, we give this out how many threads we have really in the parallel region. Um, it's also, of course, something which is then assumingly not four times executed, but only one times executed because we restricted only to the master thread. And then we have return zero and so on. So I think the idea of this program is um, pretty straightforward. We loot here um, the GNU environment for the GNU compiler. And this time we do something like GCC. So we compile obviously this program but with a certain indicator for the compiler that we have an OpenMP program, which I do with minus F OpenMP. I still want to say that the hello um, threads here will have a output like this, which is you know optional, but it's nice here and there for the flexibility. And of course we should determine what is the actual C program. So when I compile this, um, basically, the compiler has now used the compiler directives, which we give as a pragma OMP statement, right? That we have seen in the source code. And in order to execute this now, we firstly have seen that um, in the hello threads.c program, if you look at this, I didn't assume anything in the number of threads. Right here you see, I don't compile there, threads should be four, I don't compile, threads should be eight. Um, here, I just basically had a program which is scalable to any number of threads. I actually can steer then via the job script that we were saying the last time. So let us look into the submit hello threads, how that looks like. And um, <clears throat> here we can see this important part of it. So here I do export OMP num threads, which will inform the OpenMP environment of how many threads we really will have in this hello threads program. Also, you will understand and see that we have an S run instead of an MPI run, right? That's also, of course, obvious. We don't need here MPI. So um, S run will be basically doing the job for us here to execute this. And this program and the OpenMP environment will then make sure to execute it with four threads. However, in the job script for S batch, right? There, I need to specify what, how many resources I still want. And here you see, a little bit how that could look like. And as I said earlier, um, we have here a very, very trivial examples today because we're not yet going hybrid with different MPI ranks. Instead, we focus completely on shared memory programming, which means we do here something like CPUs per task, um, which is for matching this number a little bit, saying nothing else than essentially this process or one process, which I have here defined on top, is basically having four threads available or four tasks available. And 
which is now in compiled number four, really inherently inside this you know, job. And it goes without saying, no surprises that we want to have now four times hello world, but only once we want to know how much really the um, the kind of uh, basically number of threads are in the parallel region. And you see also here, um, we use the same command with sbatch and submit there, nothing changes. We have qstat still saying us about the job in the thread. Uh, we have the job ID that's coming out that we want to look in in order to get our output. We see here we're focusing on the 83, which probably is written very soon. You see here we have always a small delay of the output. And when I more it, um, basically, then you see this kind of four different outputs. Also think about that, of course, the it's not always deterministic. So when you do this and execute this now a couple of times, what you can always do, right? You have two jobs here in Secured. You will see that the output every now and then here has not the same basically ordering. You will see that hello world from different threads will be basically uh, at different places in the output file. That is basically something because we don't have really parallel IO here. So basically there are race conditions to get the access to the file to write the statement from all these different threads. And this is, of course, something which then in a way parallel I.O. will fix, but also shows you here the, the limits of this when you use, of course, one output file that, of course, not all threads can use it at the same time. And with this, we have this different ones uh, in terms of the determinism of the output. So let's look on this. When you look, for instance, in this, here you probably see another, let's say, um, indicator that here, here the first thread was actually faster than the second thread and this might be just a really, really tiny millisecond or something faster to get the grab of the output file to write it in. And basically, you see there, um, this could be different in all these different executions. There's nothing to worry about this when you do, let's say, assignment three or so. That's just normal. And another aspect I want to um, actually show you here is, um, of course, now the inherent scalability. So what happens when we have, for instance, now... Uh, the same C program, so I will not recompile it, right? You see now, all I do is basically maybe add here eight, um, you know, kind of tasks and eight threads, and that's all I do, right? So basically, I use the same executable that I had just before, and of course now I assume when I aspect it that although I don't touch the source code in any ways, I will assume that I will have now eight times hello world, but still because of course we actually differentiate between the master thread only, only once an output on how many um, you know threads were involved in the parallel region. So let's wait a little bit until that is through and we see here if we more um, you know in this regard, we basically get what we expected. I didn't change the C program, I didn't recompile it, I did nothing with it automatically through this export essentially of the number of threads and having a, let's say, um, a, a job script, which obviously needs to be in line with this, then we basically have this eight threads now that we know in this parallel region. And I think just a final, of course, example you can imagine, because we put our emphasis here now really on shared memory programming, you would can, you know, increase this amount ever more. And then you would say, why not we use 200 or 300 threads? So it was, it's brilliant, you know, we can just, you know, have a super speed up and scale very nicely. Of course, here you have, let's say, the physical limits at the end on the system at some point in time that we are just having shared memory node or one shared memory node, which doesn't help us for really large scale applications. Because in the end, the physical number of CPU um, the threads they can work with, and also the memory address space, of course, which is in some point limited, will enable us just to have small scale applications and shared memory. So it's nothing for HPC, but it will be in the next lecture, a key ingredient of combining it with the MPI standard, right? And with this, that gets really powerful. You can optimize those applications because as we also know, at least within the node, the shared memory access is ultra fast, so we should leverage this as best as possible. Of course, it's not that easy, um, but of course, we will le learn that, um, oops, um, that we basically have here the best possibility to combine this in a way and then um, have very interesting 
problem solve, like the HPDB scan, which is also a hybrid application. So having shown this, I think this is now pretty obvious, and it goes without saying that you basically have the same things in the slide as usual. I explain here a little bit what I just said in words um, on all the different slides, the compiling step with the GCCF, so indicating that we have compiler directives of OpenMP in it, and then get an executable in the hello threads. Here, think about that, of course, the modus operandi of submitting is basically all the same. All we have to think about is now this OMP num threads. And of course, here that one process uh, really then spawns is here four um, kind of four threads, really. And this will be something becoming more and more obvious also when you do your own head on. And um, just to show you again, lessons learned from really working with students over the many years now, before we end this lecture here, or this lecture, the first part of the lecture really, um, here you see the common trap that students always fall in, or people even that, you know, start parallel programming. This is Pragma OMP parallel statement, which seems to be good here and is good here. Um, it's a very compact notation, as you can imagine. Here we don't have brackets, right? Um, and this could lead sometimes to students in, in different situations to really um, basically forget that there should be actually brackets. And what I mean by this was essentially this. We learned before that usually we have this, and then you basically have a proper bracket here somewhere, which would be then a pragma in this parallel region. And in a way, of course, this is still a valid reason here, but take away the message that really just this one line then will be executed in parallel, right? So this is basically, um, very important to understand it's a compact notation just for one of these lines and this could mean that you know when you do different lines and you forgot to put the brackets that you are basically asking yourself why was this not computed in parallel and of course this compact notation we can also submit here's the same idea cpus per task four and then basically the number of threads we expect for i don't compile this now again here so you see we have already the executable created and would be basically done with the same steps of using basically um, first the modulo GNU and then essentially the GCC minus F OpenMP and then minus O uh, compact hello threads and, and then basically have the compact hello thread C reference in it and would also have the same functionality. So basically let's submit that here. Um, it has the same functionality, of course, than um, you know the others that basically we have seen before of scaling then up to the number of threads I want to have in the job script. So looking up now in this more compact notation and what the output will be, we see here the 88 is already finished. So let's look into this a little bit. And what we see here is, of course, that now you remember in the compact notation, um, we had here the you know, the main thread on the top and the bottom, the story saying like, okay, this is not in parallel. And what is in parallel is really only this one line statement. And here you'll see also that, of course, getting the overall number of thread is something where you basically can see um, is also available to all the different threads that I have in order to give, for instance, this interesting output here. And that's really already um, actually is all I wanted to leave on the table here for your first um, part of the lecture. Um, they will basically continue the second part of the lecture with more work sharing constructs and then understanding a bit more about critical regions. So see you then.